So the World Brother Camporee, it's an annual event. It's held in September, and there's usually upwards of 3,000 attendees from Canadian and American scout troops, mostly coming from New York, Maryland, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Ontario, and Quebec. The camp alternates each year between being hosted in Canada and the US. In the even numbered years, it's held in the US on Wellesley Island State Park in the Thousand Islands. And in the odd numbered years, it's held in Canada at the Riverside Cedar Campground near Morrisburg, Ontario. Um, I've been attending since 2016, or sorry, sorry 2015. Um, there's actually a, one of the photos in this collage is me in that bright uh, Hawaiian shirt near the bottom. It's actually a Snoopy Eagle Scout shirt I was wearing that year. Uh, the program itself for the activities, you know, they vary from year to year and the, the participants can pick and choose and, and what they want to do. Um, but the one thing that doesn't change is patch trading is a very integral part of this camporee. Now, one thing though, if you've never been and you want to come, um, you know, patch trading is very big. However, it's important to note that cash does not change hands. This is trading only. Um, we don't buy or sell at the Brotherhood Camporee. So during the daytime, there's tons of traders out in the field. And then when it gets too dark, we move indoors. The troop from Maryland brings a nice big tent. And when they're done eating their dinner, they open it up to trading in the evening until it's time to go to bed. Now, the current Brotherhood Campery goes back to 1974. However, there's two events prior to that that are considered to be the parent and grandparent of the World Brotherhood. In 1956, there, they had, this will be considered the grandparent event of Brotherhood. And there, there was a patch issued for this Can-Am Ori, and there was a Necker. And the, the Necker, you notice it says T-I-B-A. That actually stands for Thousand Islands Bridge Authority. That was the patch that was worn by employees of the T-I-B-A. And that patch was sewn onto Neckers, and that was considered their, the Necker for that event. The participant patch is a twill. However, if you're into collecting, you might come across an embroidered version. The embroidered version is not from 1956. That would have come off a fashion shirt that was being sold in the 80s. Uh, so be, be aware of that. Now, that fashion shirt, you might be familiar with it. It also has a fake 357 F1 on it. 1970, the Northern Lights Fellowship Campery. So this would be is considered to be the parent, the, the other event leading up to the, the creation of the World Brotherhood Campery. Uh, this is an, a beautiful shot of a gateway from the troop from Maryland uh, that they have. Uh, they've actually made replicas of all the participant crests throughout the years. They're at about plate size uh, made out of wood um, on this gateway. So we're starting at the beginning all the way up to 2018, because this photo was taken in 2019 at our last in-person brotherhood before uh, the pandemic hit. Now, just want to show you this quickly before we go into the specifics. Um, as you can see, for the most part, the design is uh, pretty consistent from year to year. Now, the whole purpose or the whole idea behind the Brother Campery or one of the th fundamental things about it is that it was decided that any profit that's generated from the registration fees would be given to the World Friendship Fund to promote scouting in underdeveloped countries. Now, when it's hosted in Canada, the proceeds are given to the Canadian Scout Brotherhood Fund. And the Canadian Brotherhood Fund provides grants like seed money for many international development projects. So let's get into the specific participant patches. I'm not, not gonna show you every single one. Uh, I'm gonna kind of touch on the ones that are have significance. So 1974 was the first of the current Brotherhood Campery, nearly a thousand people in attendance that year. Uh, Mike Hinman was responsible for designing and ordering this first crest. And as legend goes, there was a series of unfortunate events and miscalculations when ordering the badge. Uh, they had CBS 
um, written on the top half of the North America for Canadian Boy Scouts, but that's not how we were known. We were known as Boy Scouts of Canada, B, so it should have been BSC. So some Canadians were understandably not too happy with that. Uh, so they made sure to correct that in preceding years. Uh, but this being the first event is a certain badge is certainly one of the high, highly sought after ones in the collection. The host being in the in the, in the US, the, the host council at the time was the Jefferson Lewis Council. And then the next year now being hosted in Canada, it, it was Kingston District was the, the host. And it was originally held at Charleston Lake Provincial Park. But then the province decided they were going to turn it into a wild wilderness preserve. So it was closed to Brotherhood in 1977. Um, now the CBS, of course, was changed to the BSC at the top. And the other significant difference in the badge design is that in the middle, instead of having a line designating the border between the two countries, they now have the World Scout Fleur de Lis to separate the two countries as a more of a friend, fellowship brotherhood uh, symbol. Uh, 1978 was the fifth anniversary and the camp chief, Gary Williams, he commissioned this rectangular badge instead of steering away from the, the circular design to commemorate the fifth anniversary. However, the following year a decision was made that all the succeeding patches would be circular in design and would not change except for the color and the year. 1980 badge is pretty significant. Um, it's bordered and lettered in black. This was done as a symbol of remembrance for the lives lost in the Iranian hostage crisis. And they only issued one badge per attendee. All the extras were burned to discourage trading of the symbol of remembrance and cooperation between the two countries. So the 1980 is by far the most difficult one to find and acquire and add to your collection. And it's the one that will cost you the most money. In 1984, there are two badges, uh, just a difference in color. Um, we're now the Jefferson Lewis Council and the St. Lawrence Council had merged to form the Seaway Valley Council, who was the, uh, the host. And they, uh, from what I understand, when the badges were ordered and they came in, the coloring was wrong. So they had to get the manufacturer to redo them. But then they ended up with two copies of the badge. So they decided to give all the participants both versions that year. 1992, the black border on this badge was originally chosen simply for aesthetic purposes. However, it has now come to serve as a memorial for Ed Mason who passed away while attending this year's camp. 2000, the host is noted as the Hiawatha Seaway Council because in 1999, the Hiawatha Council merged with Seaway Valley Council informed the Hawartha Seaway Council. 2001, Kingston District is now known as Loyalist District. And then two years later, it became Loyalist Area as Scouts Canada did a whole reconfiguration and did away with districts and turned them all into areas. 2010, now we're being hosted by the Longhouse Council. The Hawatha Seaway Council had merged with Cayuga Council, County Council, and they adopted the current Longhouse Council name. Then these two badges in 2020 and 21 are the most recent. Now, because of the pandemic, the 2020 Brother Campery had to be canceled. Um, there was, there, there's been, there's talk, I'm told that there is going to be an official 2020 badge made available. However, it hasn't been made available yet. And at the time, um, uh, uh, Kevin Nugent went ahead and made a private issue of the of a 2020 version um, for fear that there wasn't going to be an official one, and he wanted to make sure he didn't have a hole in his collection. So the 2020 one that you see is not an official Brotherhood patch. The last year for 2021, uh, we did have a virtual campery, so not our traditional. Brotherhood in-person uh, event, but we did have something to market. Um, so that 2021 is an official Brotherhood patch. 
So that brings us up to this year, but we're not nowhere near the end of the presentation. Uh, there are fakes out there, so be, be aware. Uh, this one here, 1976, I mean, when you see them side by side, it's not too difficult to tell the difference, but you know, if you're, if you're not uh, aware, if you just saw that fake, you know, it's something that you could get fooled by, um, especially on, uh, on a listing on eBay if you're not really paying attention. 1980 this this fake is a little bit more obvious there's a few more differences that when you start to examine it closer so you know be aware there are fakes of the brother camper because it is a, a highly collected event then we get into scramble patches so scramble patches after the Princeton patches will be the next big thing to collect and this started in 2000 uh, the first scramble patch it was earned by participating in the camp wide game. The task for the first year was to collect and assemble letters to spell out the word brotherhood. This was introduced by a suggestion from Paul Fitzgerald. The idea being behind it that it would provide a fun way for the scouts from both sides of the border to interact with each other. Now the camp wide scramble is for scouts only. It's only for youth can participate and earn these badges. So as an adult scouter, if you're collecting them, the only way to get one is to is to trade for it. And the one on the right, I'm going to get a bit more into the details of the design in, in a few slides when I talk about the back patch. So we'll, we'll come back to that one. So these first two were just done um, two years apart when it was being hosted in the US. But then starting in 2004, they decided to make it an annual um, activity. Uh, and they went to this square design with these different animals. The tortoise in 2004 is definitely the, the hardest one of all the scramble patches in my experience to find. Um, and, but all the other ones are fairly, not, not that difficult after the tortoise. And these can be arranged to form a, a totem. So here's some more of the, the totem pieces, the scramble patches. So in order to make a totem, of course, you need a top and a bottom. So there are tops and bottom pieces. Now, the one in the bottom, of the, there's two pictures. It, it, at first, it might look like it's the same badge, but there's basically these two, two versions of both of these. There's a, a Canadian version and a US version, because of course, any BSA badge needs to have a Florida Lee on it. So the ones with the Florida Lees are from the, from the BSA side. And then beyond that, there are a ton of other badges for brotherhood. Uh, typically, uh, in any given year, when you go to the trading post, there are two or three additional designs or other badges, usually at least one CSP, maybe another round. Um, so there's different versions, different badges that can be collected. These are just a few examples of some of the other fun badges that you can collect for brotherhood. Another one for uh, there. Then, of course, you get into some where they, now they have different border designs, you know, with all the different patch trading trends and the crazes that you see over the years, you'll find those in Brotherhood patches. Uh, this one is another neat design. And then in the bottom, that little blurry picture, it's a, the staff version of that year's crest, as an example. And you get the full color versions in 2011. And then you get different contingents will make crests too now. So this Carlton area, there was a series of CSP shaped badges um, in subsequent sub years. And then there's the centerpiece to bring them all together. Uh, 2015, this was the first year I went. Um, this was the year that we had Terry Grant as our special guest. Terry Grant, better known as Man Tracker uh, from the TV show. He was the chief scout of Can Scouts Canada at the time. Um, so they made these badges in, in his the year for the year that he was there. 2017, I particularly like these ones too. These were Canada's 150th uh, Confederate anniversary of Confederation. So they made a lot of really cool special badges for that year. So this is that large back patch from 2002 that I was mentioning. So this patch was the first back patch that was made for Brotherhood. It was designed by Ray Gould, eight inches, and it was the showing that shows the two national birds facing outwards, united and on guard on a field of stylized flags over the Thousand Islands Bridge. 
which crosses the world's largest undefended border. The United We Stand reference was a direct response to the terrorist attacks of 9-11. So that's why all those year, that year's badges all have that uh, awesome design on them. And a couple other back patches that have been made over the years. Uh, these are examples of what the Canadian staff badges look like. So these are the three years that I've been there on staff. So what I started doing and when it's in, hosted in Canada, I go down as an offer of service and help run some of the programming or do, do whatever is needed to, to help out. And then when it's hosted in the US, I just go to trade badges all day. And of course, beyond badges, there's pins, there's necker shift slides or woggles, there's neckers, there's all kinds of things. Um, when you go to the, the trading post, I mean, they got a whole lot of different clothing, uh, all kinds of things. Um, campfire, this is an actual photo of, the, of our campfire brotherhood. We do like to have our fires big. And the one last thing I wanted to share with you, now this isn't something that you can collect, but it's something that's very special that I wanted to show. Back when it's first started in 1974, uh, Everett Wilson and Dale Williams from Troop 967 in Harbor de Grace, Maryland, they had the foresight to establish a living document of each campery. They created a handmade walking stick that would bear a metal tag with the name of each year's camp chief. And the walking stick is still is carried by the camp chief each year to open and close the campery. And that's the end of the presentation. And we'll see what questions we have. Right, so I see there are a few questions in the chat, so I'll try to kind of cover those. And if any of my special guests that are on, if they feel free to chime in at any time, if you uh, if you would like to. So 2001 black color for 9/11 question mark. So 2002 is when they were sort of commemorating the terrorist attacks 9/11. Okay. The black and gold from the 2001 patch is actually the official colors at the time of Loyalist Area. Uh, Loyalist Area had just done an amalgamation with another district. We went from districts to area. And we took a color from each district to make the black and gold to unify the two districts. And that became the Loyalist Area Brotherhood Committee official colors. So that's why that patch was black and gold. Now that was ordered months and months ahead of the event. And actually 9-11 was 10 days before camp. And uh, we took, as Kevin said, we took a big hit that year in attendance. 2019, we probably had about 1,500, 1,600 folks. Uh, the American side has always had a little bit more because the camp has become their official uh, council fall camp. Uh, generally, up, up until 9-11, uh, we, were, we were north of uh, 3,000 pretty much every year. Uh, since 9-11, uh, I think our, our smallest year was about 1,200. And we're running around the 2000s uh, now. So it has come back up uh, over the last number of years. Um, who knows what the pandemic's done to us, but uh, that's, what, that's what we were back up to is around 2000, 2200. So someone in the chat also asked about the fakes, the to which one was the real, which one was the fake. So I went back to those slides. So the reels on the left um, in the 1980, the years 19 on one side, 80 on the other. Then on the fake, they have the entire year 1980 all on the left side. Yeah, so the 1976 on the left and the, the fake is on the right. Again, the text is all in the same plot, but you can tell the difference looking at the fleur de lis in the middle. The map is a little bit different. I mean, it's just not as clean. Well, dip, but crossing the border comments, I mean, that uh, you know, would be no different than pretty much any other border crossing. I mean, I know you hear stories about when the people scouting, traveling in uniform and getting across the border a lot easier. But, you know, th these days, you know, there's really nothing can really guarantee you a, a smoother border crossing, but it certainly never hurts when you're traveling in your uniform. Uh, when I was, when I was crossing with youth, we, uh, we had a binder and uh, not only would we have the camp permission form, We'd have a letter from uh, signed by both parents um, in in a uh, in a folder that we gave to each driver that was carpooling, 
Um, I, the, 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 the troop scouter or myself would be leading the, uh, the convoy of three or four cars. We pull up, say, look, the next four cars are all part of the same group. Here's my binder. You hand them about a two inch binder full of paperwork and say, we're going to the scout camp at the, the state park. And they just go, yeah, thanks very much. Have a nice day. Um, because they were well informed that every, every other year on the U S side, and uh, as well as on the Canadian side, that on that date, uh, there would be, uh, you know, anywhere between, uh, you know, 800 and uh, 2,000 people crossing the border to go to this event. Um, and they were well notified in advance that both committees uh, were very, uh, were very um, tied into the, the to uh, both the parks and the, uh, the border guards, uh, letting them know what was going on and what to expect. Randall was just asking where it would be held in 2022. So this year it would be in the, in the U S would be turned to, to host it. Uh, so hopefully things are able to actually happen in person this year. And there hasn't been any announcements that I've seen to the contrary. Uh, actually there's a virtual meeting, I think this coming week. Uh, there's some things that are working out right now, specifically with the, uh, uh, the local health departments and uh, also uh, with the booking system, I understand as well. So once they get that all straightened out, then uh, notices uh, will be sent out and the advertising will go live.